Father, we come to you this evening. We thank you for the blessings of this day and the blessings of this time for us to be together in this next hour to study from your word. We just pray as, as teachers and listeners that we focus on your word and strive to, to build up our, our knowledge and our understanding of, of things of the past and of your will that would make us stronger each day. We're thankful for each person that's, that's present here. Heavenly Father, we just pray through the songs we sing and the
Good to see everybody tonight. Appreciate so very, very much your presence. And tonight we're looking at the final lesson uh, in our workbook relative to the book of Daniel. And for some folks, I kind of get the vibration that they're heaving a big sigh of relief, that they're kind of glad to see this study come to an end. <laughs> There's been a lot of intense material in Daniel because of the method of presentation that it gives us. It is this unfolding of God's will and God's plan. And whenever we get into that, there are a lot of factors that are given. There are a lot of things that are given to us symbolically. And as a result, it's very easy to read through this. And I do not know what in the world he's talking about. But we've been trying to, to make some sense of it and to, to pull it together. Tonight, in looking at these last couple of chapters in, in the book of Daniel, we kind of have to lean very heavily on history to see the fulfillment of the things that Daniel was talking about. You know, we talked through the passages in Daniel where he saw Nebuchadnezzar's image of the head of gold and the various metals that made up that image and how that was Daniel as he interprets it to Nebuchadnezzar, saying these are the next four world kingdoms that will come. You know, you start as the first one, and there's three more to follow after you. Well, that image in and of itself is giving prophecy of what was going to happen over the space of several hundred years. He goes back and repeats that again as he uses some imagery of, uh, uh, of the idea of, of a ram with a couple of horns and then a goat that comes in and talking about precisely the next two kingdoms, the Medo-Persian Empire and then the coming from the, the west of the uh, uh, Greek Empire and all of the domination that would come with that and the way which it would affect the people of God because at this point they're still over there in Babylonian captivity. But during the days of the Medo-Persian Empire, they were going to be released and be able to come back to the city of Jerusalem. But that rebuilding process slows down, doesn't move very smoothly in some respects. And then you have eventually then the Greeks coming through and they dominate this area as well. But then also involved in that prophecy was we mentioned the idea of there being a rapid ending to the work of this goat that comes in and four other horns grow up in its place. And what we're talking about is the early death of Alexander the Great, who was the one that had been responsible for the conquest of all of the known world but then whenever Alexander uh, the Great died in his early 30s, his kingdom was divided up primarily among four of his primary generals. And the Ptole uh, Ptolemy was one of the generals, and he was the one who wound up taking over that yellow region over there that was the section there which was Egypt and moving up toward the land of Canaan. Then Seleucus took over the section there in the light blue and had a very large section. Then Antigonus took over the area of Asia Minor and some of Greece. And then the Macedonian section over there in the dark green, that was another one that was dominated by another one of his four generals. So that kind of gives us the breakdown as Daniel had foretold it was going to happen. And that gave us some indication for the people of God as to how things were going to unfold. And whenever things unfolded according to that material given so much in advance, it only testified to the fact that God was in control of things and how the things were going to unfold according to his purpose. As we move then into these last couple of chapters, in chapters 11 and 12, there was a lot of information given about turmoil and struggle and battles and wars that were going to be fought. And these were dealing with what happens here in the, to this lower region here 
The, the tannish color there is the area that the Seleucid kings had continued in expanding their claim. And they now become a very major empire. And then you see the Ptolemies still controlling the area there in the yellow down there around the land of Egypt. But you move up toward Jerusalem and you can see how that area is caught right in the middle between these two great empires. And as a result of that, there is a constant series of wars that are going to take place. In fact, there were six major wars that took place moving up and down that area of the Jordan River Valley there, as the kings from the north and the kings from the south came and fought each other. And this is referenced here in the latter part of um, chapter 11, talking about the way in which these kings did battle with each other. And uh, the northern kingdom tended to be victorious in most of these situations beginning in verse 40 of the 11th chapter. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. And he shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy, and utterly to make away many." And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. The reference here is dealing with what happened with, when Antigonus, uh, Antiochus, let me get the right name out here, when Antiochus wants to expand the northern kingdom and wants to go down into Egypt, and is for a period of time victorious in that. But then the Parthians begin to attack from the north. And so Antiochus realizes, I've got to go back up there and defend the other end of my kingdom. And so he leaves the region of Egypt and this section down to the south, and he puts um, one of his generals in charge of things over around Jerusalem, and he hurries off to do battle with the Parthians. Well, during this time that Antiochus has been a ruler, he has been vile, and he was doing everything that he could to erase and to extinguish the idea of a Jewish ethnicity. As we noticed in the last lesson, he refused to allow the uh, male children to be circumcised. And if a, a family was found to have a circumcised infant, then that family was to be destroyed. And he erected a, 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 a place of worship, an altar, right in the second temple that had been built when they came back from the, their Babylonian captivity. And he offered uh, incense and offered sacrifice to uh, these pagan gods right there in what had been the temple of God. And on and on his efforts go to try and absolutely destroy anything that was Jewish. That's why there was such a tremendous emphasis made by all of these Hellenist generals. That's a phrase used for generals of a Greek background to try and take this whole section of the world and make them live like the Greeks, worship the gods of the Greeks, speak the language of the Greeks, use the currency of the Greeks. Everything was to be about them, and there was not much passion at all for allowing local municipalities to maintain their standard of living and their ancient customs and their traditions. And so he really, really, uh, Antiochus had a, a, a very, very 
intense passion about establishing or, is, or to trying to erase the, the existence of the Jewish nation. He began to replace high priests at whim. If somebody offered him a bribe, he would arrange for the assassination of the current high priest and he'd pick a new one that offered him the best bribe. And so he was defiling everything Jewish that he possibly could. Well, whenever he goes off then to fight against the Parthians, Jason, who had been a depo who was relative to one of the deposed high priests, begins to put together what's referred to as the Maccabean Revolt. And we're talking here about time-wise things that happen between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But these are things that Daniel was having revealed to him in these visions as to what was going to happen. And so Antiochus goes ahead and he takes off on his, his battle. And fortunately, even though he is such a vicious persecutor of the Jews, he dies in about the third year of his reign. His reign was cut short. Now, in the process of this, he began to round up those Jews, the, Has the uh, Hasmoneans, I think they were referred to, and, and call them out for their continued practice of Jewish customs. And they were a pacifist group, and he butchered them by the hundreds. And they quietly went to their death because they were not going to renounce their God and the service to God that had been characteristic of them down through their generations. But Jason rises up and is very talented in his military maneuvering, and he also has the zeal and the enthusiasm of the local Jews to resist every, all of these efforts by Antiochus to uh, control them. Now, with Antiochus gone, fighting the Parthians, Lysias, I think, was the guy's name who was put in charge, and he wasn't too sharp. And he put together four different armies to go beat Jason into submission, but rather than uniting their forces, they came one at a time. And Jason whooped them. And so eventually then the Jews are able to uh, de have a degree of independence again from the complete domination of the Romans or from, of, the, of the, the Greeks and, and the Seleucid kings. Now right about this time also as a complication to this picture is that the Roman Empire was growing and becoming a powerhouse. And they began to have an influence over this part of the world. And they put together an alliance with the Ptolemy families in Egypt and helped guarantee their independence because they wanted Egyptian grain to be brought back up to, to Italy. And so Antiochus, you know, he's, he's dem you know, making demands that this is my country and, and you can't do that. And the story is told of, of a man who had formerly been his friend, but he comes as a Roman ambassador. And he says, no, you take your forces and you leave. And he says, well, I, I need to think about that. And this old friend took his cane and walked around Antiochus and drew a circle. He said, you tell me what you're going to do before you step outside that circle. Well, realizing he didn't have time to organize any resistance, he says, okay, we'll leave. And so he took his forces and withdrew from, from Egypt and was able to, to move on. Well, the Romans figure in at different times in affecting what these kingdoms are going to do, and soon nobody's strong enough to withstand the Romans. And they eventually will move through this area and take over the whole thing. So what we find happening here is that Antiochus uh, the fourth, he leaves, he goes back, uh, he fights his battles and does his work, but God eventually terminates him very quickly, as is mentioned here in verse 45 of the 11th chapter. 
And then it begins to talk about the memories of this, the efforts of the people to once again regroup and restore things the way they needed to, to be. And so that's what opens up in the next few verses of the 12th chapter. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of the people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. In other words, Antiochus is awful, but God's going to give you deliverance. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, uh, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. There's going to be some people who will die who are still standing for the ways of Judaism. There are going to be some folks who are going to die, and they were traitors to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those actions will be remembered against them as well. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Those who are doing the right thing and trying to defend the right ways of God will be rewarded by God. And they that, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So he said there's going to be folks who are going to steer you back to the right and true way, to the way that you should be living, how you should be serving God. And even though Antiochus has tried to extinguish you as a nation and to corrupt and make you stop doing everything that you were supposed to do, to those who will be faithful, God will reward them and bless them for their steadfastness to him. Now, let's look at the, the questions in, in uh, uh, the ending of this lesson in, in verse or in page 89, and we will begin to see then how some of these things come together. Like I said, these last two lessons have had to lean very heavily on historical fact and the things that were the fulfillments of these prophecies. And here again, the history that I've been reciting here is things that happened hundreds of years after Daniel's lifetime. By the time Daniel is writing this book, he is already an old man. He had grown up, you know, back going all the way back to the, starting out in the city of Jerusalem before Nebuchadnezzar took it over. He had served in the court during the final years of the Babylonian uh, Empire. He was then made a counselor and a governor during the days of the Medo-Persian Empire. And now he is making prediction as to what's going to happen whenever the Greeks come to visit and, co and come to call. So he is advanced in years. And he has some real questions, we'll notice at the end of this, about well, when's this going to happen? And, and God's saying, Daniel, you're not going to have to worry about it because you're not going to be around to see it. These are things that are going to happen on down the way. Now, looking at question one and showing the parallels to modern history. He said, name some modern tyrants and dictators who have persecuted and destroyed those with whom they disagreed on political or religious grounds. Yeah. That's exactly right. What you see happening is that, you know, and Hitler was determined to try and to extinguish the, the, uh, uh, the race of the Jews. He saw them as an inferior race. And there were other factors that were involved in, in what he did. But we have other examples, maybe more contemporary, is the persecution that goes on even now to those who would profess Christianity in the country of, of uh, China. Often they have to be meeting in secret. There is great risk to them serving God because Christianity is not well received in, in that particular nation. Years ago, there was a purge that took place. Uh, Pol was, uh, Pol Pot, I think, Pol anyway, was his, you know, the shortened version of his name in Cambodia. And he moved in and his people got all the nice houses and such. And those who were not in agreement with him were simply turned out into the fields to suffer and, and uh, to die there. So we've had other tyrants down through the years who have tried very viciously 
to make people do things the way they want them done. There's oftentimes discussions on a modern day basis. I think that um, uh, China has been accused of all kinds of human rights violations, especially against some of the, the Muslim community that is found within their borders. And so these kinds of things have happened frequently down through the days of history. It says, was the time of these despotic tenures brief but intense, fleeting and short-lived, but did not seem so at the time? In other words, whenever we see how these really intense persecutions took place, were they really bad but for a short period of time, or are we talking about something you covered, like, say, hundreds of years? It was, it was pretty short. And that's what God is saying here through Daniel about the things that Antiochus was going to do. You know, the idea of, of uh, the, the uh, desecration of the, the temple and the other vile things that he did, it was going to be terrible. Many Jews would die at his hand, but... As it turns out, he only got to reign for three or four years before God took him out of the way. So being a, a, this period of time of, of, uh, of struggle was the idea. It says, how does this relate to the rule of Antiochus IV Epiphanes and the Jews? And it's very parallel to what we've been talking about. The idea of these things being of short duration, but could be extremely harsh during the time that they were, they were in force. In question two, he says, how had Antiochus misjudged Judaism in his efforts at blotting out the religion? What did he think would happen if he persecuted them? All They'd all quit. That they would just roll over and this would all die. He thought the persecution would discourage and wipe out, you know, such practices. And that's the same thing that the Romans thought in New Testament times whenever they began such bitter persecutions against Christians. That's what the book of Revelation really is focusing on, is the fact that Christians were going to suffer tremendously, but that God would see them through the difficulties that came their way. So question three, were the Maccabees capable of defeating the Syrian armies of Antiochus? Well, that was a yes and no answer to me. If Antiochus's general, Lysias, would have thought better, consolidated his forces, and made one major push against Jason and the Maccabees, he probably would have been able to have crushed their rebellion. But he kept sending smaller armies to go do it, and Jason was able to defeat each one. Now, whenever you get some of the older Bibles, they have what's often referred to the, those forgotten books or hidden books or whatever. There's about 13 different books that our Bibles commonly do not have in them because they never pass the muster of being certifiably inspired. They were never quoted from by, by Jesus or any of the known uh, writers that were inspired and blessed of the Holy Spirit in that regard. There are some things in there that are a little bit more like fables, but First and Second Maccabees are two of those books, and they are basically a history of Jason and the Maccabean revolt and what was fought to try and, and uh, uh, destroy Antiochus and his influence o over the Jews. And so these were books were written primarily between the Old Testament and the New Testament, they were never quoted from by any inspired writer. They just do not pass the tests of being inspired literature themselves, but we can look at them for some degree of historical benefit, and so that's what we find here if we want to find a record of what happened with, with the Maccabean revolt. And so uh, it goes on, uh, what political circumstances made it impossible for his armies to mount a combined effort against the, the Jewish rebels. Well, things were just fragmented. You know, Antiochus himself was busy, you know, fighting with the Parthians, and so there wasn't good leadership. And so this group did not have it together to be able to defeat Jason and the Maccabees, 
because it's kind of like with the American Revolution, you know, Britain had the bigger armies and they were better equipped and they had all the pluses going for them. But the Americans had a fervor and a zeal about fighting for independence and gaining control of their homeland. And so with that fervency and with that dedication, they were able to defeat military forces from Europe that in many respects were far superior to them. But the European forces didn't know how to do guerrilla warfare and some other things, and as a result, America became free and, and independent. So with the combination of circumstances as they unfolded, Antiochus lost his control on this part of the world, just as Daniel said was going to happen. It says, is it your opinion that God was involved in this situation that arose in Parthia and ultimately rescued the Jews from a concerted attack from Syria? And while we can't find a verse that tells us that this what was the connection, it's pretty probable that that was the case. Of course, all the powers that be are ordained of God, and looking at that unfolding of events, we know that that had to be God behind it to make it happen, and so, you know, it, it's pretty sensible to, to make that, that connection. This next question helps answer something that a lot of times we get puzzled about, you know, there's many Jewish festivals and such that, that we have very little knowledge of. And one of them is, is uh, Hanukkah, which happens in late November and, and early December. It says, how does the Hanukkah celebration relate to the deliverance of the Jews by the Maccabees and the defeat of Antiochus and the cleansing of the temple? Well, that's what Hanukkah is celebrating is that they did a rededication of the temple after they'd gotten rid of Antiochus, wiped out all of the uh, trappings of, of idol worship in the temple and worked to sanctify and cleanse everything and once again start worshiping God from the temple in Jerusalem. There was an interesting thing that happened. They set up the, the, golden, the candlestick that was to provide light inside the temple and they only had enough oil for the lights to burn for a day. But the lights didn't go out. And those lamps burned on for seven more days before they were able to get a supply of oil and to refill them and keep those lights burning. And so that's why the symbol for Hanukkah is that multi you know, uh, candelabra to show that candlestick and the light of the Jews being somewhat of a, a perpetual thing. So the, that Hanukkah celebration is the rededication of the second temple after the success of the defeat of the Seleucid Empire by Jason and the Maccabeans, where they got their independence. Question five, explain the perspective of this period of persecution and wickedness in terms of the premillennial mindset. Well, of course, they don't see this as being applicable to, to Antiochus. They say that Daniel's talking about the Antichrist that's going to come and about some kingdom that he is going to, to, to set up you know, at the end of time. It says, the, his, is the historical Antiochus the anti-God figure of the prophecy or is it a coming antichrist, uh, the, the meaning of the vision? And putting all the pieces together, it comes out to be the historical Antiochus. Then there's some spots where you start here, it jumps to here, and jumps to there. Remember we talked about Daniel's 70 weeks. There were three different periods of time talked about. One was the, the beginning of things and the time up into the coming of the Messiah, and then it goes to the ending of the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, there's several spots in Scripture and in prophecy where this is used, and where Daniel winds up this book is that he takes it from what's going on today to what's going to happen with the, the fall of the empire, with what's going to happen in the days of Antiochus, and then even on to the coming of the Messiah. That telescoping effect is found here in the latter part of the 12th chapter. 
You know, in Revelation, it starts out with the Roman persecution, then the victory of the Lamb, and then Judgment Day. In Matthew 24, Jesus starts out talking about the fall of Jerusalem, and then he goes on to talk about the ending of time. So this is kind of a common prophetic uh, idea that is used. Question 7 discusses the question of whether the resurrection described is a literal or figurative one. It is a figurative one, which is foreshadowing the final resurrection. In question 8, in Daniel 12, 4, Daniel is told to seal up the words of the vision. Why do that? Well, because it was going to be a long time before that was going to be fulfilled. This was something just to hold on to, and later the Jews would reflect back on it. And that's why it was sealed. The numbers that are there, we can work ourselves silly trying to figure out why many day, this many days and what it means or whatever. But the whole point is that this is going to be fulfilled at a later time. These things will happen on down the road. And so what is your general reaction to all that we've read and experienced in the study of the book of Daniel? Well, the point that we're seeing is that God takes care of his people and that God will, God's will is sometimes foretold and then fulfilled. That you have prophecies about it starting out, then it goes on from there. And that last one was an opinion question. Do you find it less confusing now that you studied it in this way? Well, I hope so, but that's a question you've got to answer on your own. Hopefully we've been able to make some sense of the book of Daniel. Haven't had uh, the opportunity to, surprise, to deal with every detail, every verse, and all the other, because we're just going to be hard-pressed to be able to, to make that all happen. Make sense? Any questions or comments? Now, what we're going to be doing, uh, hopefully, hopefully I will have them back from the printers by, by next Wednesday evening, but we're going to look at the remaining books of prophecy, the minor prophets they're referred to, in a workbook that I have written that I guarantee is much simpler than what we've just been through. And we will be looking uh, at uh, a quick survey of the, the uh, uh, minor prophets and be able to draw some lessons from each one of those. And so hopefully uh, as soon as I get those back, we will get those distributed so that we will be able to, to uh, pick up on that. Okay. All right. Today, I had uh, a rather interesting experience. I was um, substitute teaching, and there was a video and a survey that the kids filled out. And then there was a video that we showed to the eighth graders that I was working with. And the title of the video was A Cry for Help. And it was talking about the problems that young people are facing in our generation and the intensity of that and the consequences of that. You know, as we were kids growing up, you might have to deal with the bully at school, but when you got home, the bully wasn't there. And you had a chance to rest and recoup a little bit, maybe plan what your next strategy was going to be, but you had a chance to disengage for a little bit. And if there were problems that you faced, you usually were able to find either a trusted family member or a trusted adult from some other circle in your life where you were able to share with them some of the things that you are going through. But nowadays, it won't go away. With social media as it is, that phone can be dinging virtually 24 hours a day. And the harassments can continue, and the inflammatory statements can continue, and the difficulties can continue. One of the statistics from that video that